You know, in some countries, like in in China, you'll be imprisoned if you are a Christian. In India, if you become a Christian, your parents will disown you. In the Middle East, they'll execute you. But in America, if you become a Christian, you just have a broader selection of CDs to choose from. Thank you for inviting me back after 35 years. I'm glad you've forgiven me for whatever it was that kept me from coming back sooner. <laughs> the word is revolution, but no one's fired the shot. Every side has battle plans with detailed counterplots And the world is closely watching as we near the battle line So if you're truly wise, you keep your eyes on Palestine The water is polluted, the air is filled with death Someday it won't be easy to stop and catch your breath But it's all in revelation, it's part of his design If you're truly wise, you keep your eyes on Palestine In Washington, things were getting hot I gave blood in Chicago I went anemic on the spot I would have hitchhiked out to Woodstock But it's all a waste of time So I'm writing down this song to you To sing and pass along to you if you're truly wise, you keep your eyes on Palestine. La 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 Revolution. La 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 Peace or pollution. La 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 Tribulation. Getting sickly. Ah, la, 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 It's, uh, it's hard to know what to sing in a church. I, I spent most of my time singing in places that are not Christian places. But my heart is most warm for not just a concert, but concerts that I did for 10 or 15 people. But it doesn't really matter what size audience there is. There is no such thing as an audience. There are only individuals. 
God is speaking to people individually. He's not saying, hey, you guys, listen to this, check this out. And then, then his spirit does not broadcast a general message to everybody. God's a very specific God. He loves you. And when you come to church, you don't come to church, you come to God. And if you come only to be part of a group, you're missing some of the beauty of being a Christian. I sing a song, I don't know, what, this song has nothing to do with what I just spoke about. I have no idea what this next song is going to be. I'm spinning the wheel in my head, and it's slowing down. Oh, lose a turn, sorry. Alice Cooper is a drag queen, Bowie's somewhere in between. Other bands are looking mean, me I'm trying to stay clean. I don't dig the radio, I hate what the charts pick. Rock and roll may not be dead, but it's really sick. All over the world, this jockeys talk the same. Every town I play is like the town from where I came. Except for this town. I always say that. Tonight I really mean it. I always say that too. Well, the Rolling Stones are millionaires, flower children, pallbearers. Beatles said all you need is love. Then they broke up. Jimmy took an overdose. Janice followed so close. The whole music scene. Then all the bands are comatose. This time last year, people didn't want to hear They looked at Jesus from afar, now they call him Superstar Dear John, who's more popular now? I've been listening to some of Paul's new solo albums Sometimes I think he really is dead well, it's 1973, I wonder who we're gonna see Who's in power now, I think I'll turn on the TV The man on the news said, China's gonna beat us We shot all our dreamers, there's no one left to lead us We need a solution, some kind of salvation Let's send some people to the moon and gather information They brought back a big bag of rocks only cost 247 billion. Must be nice rocks. You think it's such a sad thing when you see a fallen king, then you find out they're only princes to begin with. Everybody's got to choose whether they will win or lose, follow God or sing the blues, and who they're gonna sin with. What a mess the world is in. I wonder who began it. Don't ask me, I'm only visiting this planet This world is not my home I'm just passing through Thank you Thanks. When I was up in Canada didn't have much money You know my toes were cold and my clothes had holes My nose was kinda runny I met along here on the street He said, look, you look like you'd like to eat I said, classic coke and a hot dog's fine He said, how about some bread and a glass of wine I said, lead me on, lead me on, lead me on Lead me on where you go my body's tired, my heart's inspired, my hunger's growing. Lead me on, lead me on, lead me on, lead me on where you're going. I said my body's tired, but my heart's inspired, my hunger's growing. He took a loaf of wonder bread, then he bowed his head. And then he filled my cup, drink it up, good friend It tasted better than a health food blend He looked straight into my eyes I was quite surprised 
You said you're locked inside, but I can set you free. You will live forever if you follow me. I said. Lead me on, lead me on, lead me on, lead me on where you go. Everybody's tired and my heart's inspired My hunger's growing, was it showing? Lead me on, lead me on, lead me on, lead me on Where you going? I said my body's tired and my heart's inspired My hunger's growing well, When I was up in Canada I didn't have much money And my toes were cold and my clothes had holes kind of runny, wasn't funny. I met a long here on the street. He said, look, you look like you'd like to eat. I said, a glass of coke and a hot dog spine. He said, I bought some bread and the living wine. I said, lead me on, lead me on, lead me on, lead me on. Where you going? Whoa, I said, my body's tired. My heart's inspired. My hunger's growing. Whoa, Sing a song about me. a hero of mine. A lot of people have heroes. Some people even like Steve Buscemi. Galilee. 
He spoke out against corruption and he bowed to no decree. And they feared his strength and power, so they nailed him to a tree. Some say he was the Son of God, a man above all men. But he came to be a servant and to set us free from sin. And that's who I believe he was, cause that's who I believe. And I think we should get ready, cause it's almost time to leave. And I think we should get ready Cause it's almost time To I'd like to thank whoever it was loaned me this guitar. Uh, it's different than my guitar. The neck is very wide, and, and I'm a much smaller man than I was. And uh, I can't reach all the notes, so I may not be able to sing some of the songs you might want to hear tonight. My guitar, which was just perfect for me, was... Uh, treated rather dismissively by the airlines and when I opened the case I found it was almost a magic trick I found there was no guitar but there were toothpicks so I am without a guitar and uh, tonight we've been loaned three guitars but thank you for your kindness to us. And I'd like to thank the church for inviting me. Uh, not just um, inviting me, but inviting my reputation, because I have a bad reputation. And, uh, well, apostasy is one word that comes to mind. They're mine, not mine. And I got in a whole heap of trouble starting back in 1968 when I decided to try to help the church. And, and not just sing in secular concerts. I opened up for Jimi Hendrix, Janis Joplin, The Doors, Buffalo Springfield, The Birds. The Animals. And I thought, I only want to sing for non-Christians. And then I went to a couple churches and I found out there are an awful lot of Christians in the church that are non-Christians. And so that's when I said, God, I'm going to do you a favor. I'm going to help your church. I'd like to tell you, in your personal life, in your spiritual life, never volunteer. First of all, God doesn't want you to tell him what you're going to do for him. He only wants you to obey and do what he tells you to do. And you might think you're doing the right kind of thing, like I could have said, I'm going to be a missionary. And if I am not skilled to, to speak the gospel in, and to treat people and bind their wounds and, and teach them how to plant corn and or whatever they grow, you know, it could be a mess. I could ruin their village. It takes a village. After a while, I realized uh, it's not that I'm sinning by doing church concerts. It's just that it's not a good fit. And, and one of the, the signs was that I was never invited back. Um, I gave altar calls at the secular concerts 
I gave altar calls at the Christian concerts, and I did this for five years, and no one ever came forward. But I never stopped, because I was a Baptist. <laughs> I'd been raised in the Southern Baptist Church, and I believed in telling people the gospel and inviting them to become a Christian. So after five years, I said, God, I'm very sorry, but I just can't do this anymore. It's not that I'm not willing to be humiliated. It's just that nobody is interested in coming forward. And then years later, I found out that a lot of people said, I, I wanted to go forward, but nobody else did, so I just sat in my chair. I was a coward, I know, but I became a Christian that night. It changed my life. I just want to say thanks for giving the altar call. Oh, okay. That, that was good to know. You know, we need encouragement in this life before it's over. And the, the, the strange thing was that I could talk to people on the street and they would become Christians. So when I came here to do the, the bitter end, I, I sang there every night. But during the day, when I was staying down at the Edison Hotel, I'd walk out on Broadway and I'd walk around and say, who, Lord, who, who, who? And I felt like God would say, so I'd go over and talk to that person, and, and sure enough, they'd be, become a Christian. Or I assumed they would. They would bow their head and pray with me after me explaining Jesus. Uh, I didn't know for sure. You very rarely know for sure if someone will stay with it. But, you know, I had learned never volunteer. So I wouldn't say, oh, that person needs help, God. I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go talk to them. No, I just would let God tell me. And because my batting average was a thousand, I thought, you know your stuff. And I'm glad that I can vaguely hear you, which I believe every Christian can. I believe that if we obey Christ in the smallest of things, then I don't know if our hearing becomes better or he speaks louder, but it requires obedience to grow and to get closer to the source. One of the girls I spoke to was this little Jewish girl. She was teaching kindergarten, and I talked to her about Jesus, and she didn't pray. And I thought, well, that's, that's very strange. But she said, I would like to come to one of your concerts, but right now I have to get back to work. And off she ran. And I'd given her the phone number of the hotel, so she called me up and said, uh, where's your concert? Oh, I can't come to it. Sorry. Are you doing another one? Yeah, I can come to that. And so she came to that one. And she became a Christian. And this little Jewish girl, uh, Perlman was her family name, Susan Perlman, she started Jews for Jesus with Moishe Rosen. And so that's one of the people I prayed with that I know the answer to. I know that she stayed with Christ. But very often, you may be discouraged. You may think you've done your best to talk to your neighbor and he shows no interest. But you don't know what God is doing in the invisible realm. You're trying to plant a seed. You're not a farmer. Good thing God does not require farmers. He requires servants. So if you scatter the seed, it's really up to God whether one takes root and whether it gets rain and whether it gets sun and whether it grows. And you know, some plants don't grow right away. It, it would be very unkind to plant something, go out in your garden and dig it up the next day to see if it was growing and put it back in and always check in on it. No, leave it alone. Only do what God says. If God says, well, now you've got to go water it, then go, go water it. I find that a good watering uh, instrument is the lawnmower. Uh, it, offer to mow your neighbor's lawn. Hey, man, you look like you've been through a hard week. I, I've had a really good week. Can I, can I mow your lawn for you? You know, don't mow it without asking them because people don't like to be interfered with or, or th you know, thrust upon. But I find that another good tool for growing is babysitting. 
They're saying, anytime you need a babysitter, please, if I can do it, if I'm home, if I'm available, please call me. Please call me. And I don't do it for money. I do it because you're my neighbor. I love you. And I'd be happy to help you with your kids. I find that service is what the world notices. And so the world noticed Christ, who came as a servant, although he was a king. And when he raised people up from their, their pallet by the side of the road, and they walked, he did that as a servant to them. He, he did not say, I'm, I'm assuming, because it doesn't say this in scripture, but he did not stand there and go, step right up, ladies and gentlemen, you are about to see one of the great wonders of the world. This man is going to get up and walk. You know him, you've known him since birth. He's been crippled all his life, but today, I tell you, he is going to walk away carrying his pallet. So, are you ready? Jesus doesn't do that. And he doesn't say, and you can get two for five shekels. Right here. It's holy oil. And here's some sand from Israel. Oh, that's right, we're in Israel. Never mind, never mind. I'll offer that to Americans. There's a lot of charlatans. And there are a lot of people claiming to be the, the Savior. And, you know, the Bible says something interesting. I'm going to sit down for a second. Okay, here's, the, here's something I remember from the Southern Baptist Church. Service is over. Anyone who's not a Christian, first of all, let's bow our heads and close our eyes. No looking. Raise your hand. I see, yes, okay, that hand. Yes, I see you. Yes, that hand. Okay, now let's open our eyes. Okay, now those people that raise their hands, come on down here. That's a dirty trick. So there would be like, you know, 14, 15 people down there. He said, okay, now anyone who is not walking as they should be walking, come down to the front. So that was half the church went down. Anyone who did not read their Bible every single day, come on down to the front. Anyone who forgot to pray this morning, come on down to the front. Getting down to the front meant something to the pastor. It meant he had reached as many people as possible. But it's not going down to the front that counts. It's following Christ that counts. Well, my life is filled with songs but I just could not get along without my friends And I'm happy now But when this good life ends I know a better life begins And love to you Mr. Stonehill with your guitar full volume on your amp You're so crazy but you know it and I love you as we both crawl toward the lamp With Clapton on guitar Charlie Watts on drums McCartney on the Hoffner bass With blisters on his thumb Dear Bobby, watch your fears all hide And disappear while love inside keeps growing Oh, let it keep growing You're older, but less colder Than the jokes and folks you spent your childhood Snow in it And 
someone died for all you friends But even better yet, he lives again And if these words do not make sense to you I hope his spirit slips on through He loves you sense to you I hope his spirit slips on through Jesus loves you I'd like to invite my friend Dennis Fridkin up on stage. He was in the band People with me. And please forgive me if, if I'm going slow, but I'm a 60-year-old man on the outside, and I'm 90 on the inside. She's a dancer in garden and she dances with the flowers in the early morning hours when the wind shifts and the fog drifts she's a dancer dancer and she knows it everywhere she goes she shows it condescending not pretending no regretting no forgetting she's a dancer I'm looking at the paper oh. And when people stop to watch her She pretends she doesn't see them Doesn't need them and where she goes, there the wind blows, though it's only with the flowers that she dances. I love John Lennon. I think that John Lennon was the Beatles. I think Paul McCartney was a friend who joined the Beatles, who also had a lot of talent for being charming and, 
and cute. But I feel like the spirit of the Beatles was in John. Not that it matters, the Beatles was just a group. But John Lennon wrote a song, and I don't know if you know this, but the last three months of John's life, well, he and Yoko were separated for quite a while, but living in the same building, Dakota. But they lived on different floors in different apartments. She was busy running their empire, making more and more money, and he, he wanted to quit. He wanted to retire. He wanted to spend time with his family. And she was saying, do one more album, one more album. And he loved her in the wrong way, which is that he submitted to her. He wanted her to be happy. And I'll bet she could be very unhappy. So he was working on another album. But he was also reading the Bible all day, every day for three months. This is according to his personal assistant who was there at all times in case John needed something. John wrote two songs about Jesus that have never been heard. I have copies of them because of a journalist friend of mine named Steve Turner who wrote the book called Amazing Grace and about 20 other books. And uh, uh, Steve, although he was blatantly a Christian, was friends with so many rockers. Paul McCartney had commissioned him to write two different books. You two had him write two or three books. Uh, Eric Clapton did a book with him. I mean, this unassuming Christian man had the ear of, of the rock community and he was such a good writer, most of them approached him at, at different times to please write a book for them because they wanted a, a really good book, not just some hagiography about them. So he said, you mustn't let anybody ever listen to these tapes because I promised John I, I wouldn't bootleg them. So John, uh, and this is nothing you'll ever read in any of Yoko's books, God bless her. And uh, I pray for Yoko. I have a lot of love for her. And, and I have an awful lot of love for John and, and for Paul. I, I've spoken to Paul before. He played a trick on me once. He walked up behind me and got right in my ear and said, I like your music. And I whipped around thinking it was one of the guys in the band. And I saw it was him and I couldn't speak. Inside, my mind was racing. You, you, you can't be Paul. You, you don't live in Los Angeles. You, you live in Strawberry Lane or something like that. You live, you're, you're a beetle. You can't, you can't, you can't be here in LA and you can't talk to me but he had heard my music and one time he said um, in the Swedish press that if Larry Norman had only chosen not to sing solely about Jesus Christ he would have been one of the stars of the 70s which I I totally disagree with because you have to write commercial songs to be a hit artist to be a star and I've never written anything commercial I've devoted all of my songs to Jesus and I'm not even sure they're good enough for God, but I know God loves me and accepts whatever we give him, even if it's the might. Um, but I don't write commercial songs. But it's nice that Paul regarded me as, as, a, as a decent Christian, one that had value, because sometimes rock and rollers, they know people who are Christians and they lose respect for Christianity. And, and you would if you were a rocker and people, you know, fussed over you, and you, you know, you are just a man. Oh yeah, so John Lennon called in the 700 Club and asked them to pray for his salvation. He prayed with them, he was on his knees. He said, I'm on my knees, I'm in a hotel room. I've been crying, so I don't know if you can understand me, but would you please pray for me, I want to become a Christian. Anyway, he wrote a song many years before called God. 
Because John, as I said, I think John was the Beatles, the spirit of the Beatles, or the soul of the Beatles. He was always trying to find something more. He was looking for truth. And so he wrote this song, God, and he, and he didn't know who God was or what God was, but he knew that it wasn't what other people leaned toward or believed in in this world. So he's saying, I don't believe in Beatles. I don't believe in Maharishi, I don't believe in the primal scream, I don't believe in, you know, and then he ended up just saying, I believe in me, Yoko and me, and that's reality. So I wrote this song called God Part Two. And then uh, a group called U2 wrote a song, and they called theirs God Part Two. So I call mine God Part Three. I don't believe in Beatles. I don't believe in rock. I don't believe in the cutting edge. That's just journalist talk. I don't believe in the cover story or even the gospel charts. Cause you can easily hit number one with a bullet but totally miss the heart. But I, yes I, I believe in God I don't believe in politics While the masses stay unfed Until the leaders change priorities And supply the poor with bread I don't believe in revolution Or the empty words of peace You can tear all of government's down, you still won't find release, but I, yes I, I believe in God, take it boys, were you in Santana? Now, I'm kind of hazy here because I wrote some verses and then I decided I wouldn't sing them, so I edited them off the album, but I can't remember what they were. What's the first word? I. Okay, thank you. What's the second word? Don't. Okay, okay, I got it, I got it. Now, give me help. What's the third word? Mumbling is right. Don't believe in Esperanto. They wouldn't know. They're not old enough. Or the dreams of Babylon. If we all spoke the same language, long ago we would have built the bomb. No recognition. <laughs> I don't believe the Aryan is a master race and if they think that Jesus was white they'd be surprised to see his face I, yes I, I believe in God don't believe in other stuff I don't believe I've got so old But I've been promised someday I'll go to heaven And I'll walk on streets of gold I don't believe I tried to sing this song Anybody know the verse here? You could just be kind to an old man Don't believe in evolution I was born to be free Ain't gonna let no anthropologist Make the monkey out of me But I, I and I I, yes I I believe in God 
believe in God. Bow, bow, bow. I'm telling you that you all have trials to face. And when you do, please believe that God can help you, no matter what the trial is in your life. If it's poverty, you know, you've, you've lost all your money, your car broke down and you're on the freeway and nobody's stopping for you. Whatever it is, God has a plan, God has a way. You are his child, he will always take care of you. I went into the hospital in 1992, clutching my chest and screaming and I couldn't stop. And I was screaming and screaming. Finally, just to get rid of me, they took me out and put me in a back room. And then somebody came in and said, uh, can I have your name? Okay. Uh, do you smoke? No. Do you drink? How? No. Do you take drugs? No. Uh, um, do you do heroin? No. It was a two-page questionnaire. And then they said, okay, thank you. And they started to leave. I went, when's the, when's the doctor going to come? And they said, very shortly. And so I said, oh, okay. But I was screaming all of this, which I won't demonstrate. And then somebody else came in the room and said, can you please be quiet? We can hear you out there. And they said, I can't be quiet. I'm, I'm in so much pain. So they moved me to a room further back. And somebody came in and said, okay. Uh, name? Larry Norman. Yeah, uh, you take drugs, you know, heroin, no, heroin, heroin, okay, thank you. Oh, uh, are you the doctor? No. The doctor will be in. So in came somebody who said, it, what's your name? He, drugs, smokes, sick, heroin, or, yeah. And then a fourth person came in and said, what's your name? I said, what do you, what do you, what do you keep coming in and asking me for? You different people come in and ask me for the, the same information. And they, uh, what kind of doctors are you? What kind of hospital is this? What kind of, and they said, oh, we're not with the hospital. We're from UCLA. We're just students. We're learning how to ask questions. I said, can't you mimeograph the answers and pass them around? And then the next thing I remember, I was going very fast. And the next thing I remember, I wasn't going anywhere at all. I had gone into, I don't believe it was a full coma, of course, because they got me out of it, but I heard somebody calling my name from far away. Mr. Norman, Mr. Norman. And I opened up my eyes. Somebody was touching me and calling my name. Only when I opened my eyes, it was a nurse, and she was shaking me and screaming my name, but it was in slow motion. And she said, He's conscious. There's a bunch of other doctors around the table. He was, he was unconscious, and he was still screaming. So then they said, let's go to, you know, the operating theater. So they started off running. <laughs> Stat! So somebody gave me a shot, and I said, what is that? I could talk normal, but they couldn't. <laughs> what is that? It is codeine. I said, I've never had any of that before. I'm going to be sick. I'm going to throw up. We're busy right now. I know, but I'm going to throw up. And that morning, only that morning, had I discovered that I was a world-class champion projectile vomiter. <laughs> when my doctor over the telephone told my brother to give me two aspirin, I swallowed them and immediately I could feel them coming up and I ran toward the bathroom and the pills raced me and beat me and touched the wall first. So that's why I was so concerned. I'm going to, uh, but, but you don't understand, I'm going to throw up. And there was maybe six or seven of them and they were very busy. I was glad that they were, 
you know, taking care of me now, but, and there was all this beautiful, expensive equipment all around, but there was some, a space right there that didn't have any equipment, and a space right there, but there were people in the way, and I felt like slow-mo camera at a replay of a football game. I looked around for my best opening. <laughs> they parted, and I hurled it. And it went all the way across the room and hit the back wall. And I said, I'm sorry, I told you I was going to throw up. This nurse was very angry. Well, next time, here, here, throw up in here. And she gave me what reminded me of going to Dairy Freeze with my dad and getting a banana split, a shallow little past, a plastic a container, kidney-shaped. And I said, that's not going to be enough. She says, just, we're busy. And they kept doing their thing, and I thought, okay, well, oh no, I'm going to throw up again. Okay, okay. So I'm looking around once more time for that winning touchdown pass. And I held the thing up with both hands and held on tight, and I blew it out of my hands. It went across the room. And I, I was just so embarrassed. I'm a very clean person, you know. I, I just felt so bad for messing up their floor. And uh, they took me upstairs on a gurney, and my foot was off the edge of the gurney a little bit, and they didn't notice, and they smashed my foot into the elevator. And I said, my foot, you just smashed my foot. And they said, oh, sorry. So they pulled back the gurney and went in again and smashed my foot again. I said, my foot, my foot. And they, they didn't understand, or they're looking at the wrong foot. So I reached down and kind of throw my foot onto the, onto the gurney, but it didn't quite make it all the way. But we went in, and then against the wall on the inside, we were safe. And um, they left me for five and a half hours. And um, then, they, th then I had the heart attack, and they said, I've lost three-fourths of my heart, and I only have one vessel left. So, like, is the general hospital, they, do they specialize in people that only have one vessel left? And she said, I'll be right back. She came out, she almost came right back in. It was like in the sitcom with the revolving door. Came back in and said, you can stay here. Are you comfortable? Is everything like you like it? Can I turn the temperature up or down for you? Would you like a popsicle? Just, just suddenly I was being treated really nice and I thought, they made a mistake. I made a mistake. But God doesn't make mistakes. And what happened because of my heart is that I've led a very different life. It's not that my life was a reprobate life and that I was sinning and that I was running away from God. I was witnessing on the street almost every day. I was praying. I was leading Bible studies. I started a Bible study for actors and, and musicians. And uh, somebody suggested we call it the Vineyard, so we did. And now it's 15 hundred churches. I was in God's will as far as I knew. I was obeying him, but then I had the heart attack. How can somebody who's following God have such a terrible thing happen to them? Who says it's terrible? I grew. I fell more deeply in love with God. I had more charity and compassion for man. I was very happy. I had been in an airplane, and then the ceiling broke off of the roof and fell onto my head, smashing me down into the seats, and I had brain damage for 12 years during this period of time leading up to the heart attack. I went to Russia, and to stop the concert, the KGB poisoned my brother and I in the restaurant, and when we went up to our room feeling unwell, there were three gigantic nurses inside the room. They weren't nurses. They were, they, they were big. They were like football players, and they knew nothing about medicine. They put a blood pressure thing on me inside out, upside down, it fell off. Then they put it on again, inside out, it fell off. Finally, they put it on right, figured out what Velcro was for, pumped it up, and then never looked at it. 
and after about five minutes of them talking to the concierge in Russia, and I, I started, my circulation was cutting off, so I tapped on, his sho on her shoulder. Yeah. It looked like a him. You know, the kind of women that run really fast in the Olympics. The Russian women. And, and she just took it off and, and then kept arguing with the concierge. And I, I kept saying, I'm fine. And then this big nurse started poking me in different places and asking, whatever she's saying. And the concierge was saying, does it hurt? I said, no. Does it hurt there? No, it doesn't hurt. Then she gets down to my appendix area and she's pushing extra hard. Does it hurt? No. So she pushes harder. Does it hurt? No. She pushes it really hard. Now she's doing a handstand on my, you know, practically. And she does it hurt? No. And you can tell them I'm not going to the hospital. The minute I said that, it was incredible. They all understood English. And the big one in the front turned to the one in the back and did one nod. And that one opened up a valise and pulled out a needle and started walking toward me. Now there was no way I could get out of that room. I was laying down on bed and they were blocking the door. What do you do? When you're in a situation like that, come on, you've been in that situation, what did you do? So what do you do? You pray. And my head was so messed up by the drugs they'd given me in my food. It was just swimming around, but there were three of them, and I remember this Bible story from the Old Testament about the, the Jewish nation was up on a rise, looking down at the enemy who was about ready to kill them. There were three different factions, three different countries, three different tribes had come together all to slay the Israelites. And God told them, don't go down there and fight. Instead, praise me. So they stood on the top of the mountain praising God. The three armies below got confused, turned on each other, attacked each other, and killed each other until no one was left alive. And that's all I could think of. And I said, okay, God, this is not my best prayer, but can you please make these people turn on each other and fight with each other, argue with each other? And immediately, they started doing that. They started yelling at each other in Russian. I don't know what they were saying. And then the concierge kind of swept them out of the room, just nudging them little by little, and looked back and went, like, <laughs> I don't know what happened, but you're a lucky fellow. Because she knew they were KGB. And she knew this was common practice, was to, to pretend somebody had a problem with their appendix, take them to the hospital, open them up, puncture their appendix so that they died by natural causes. And any autopsy would show that they it had been natural death, not murder. So I thought, okay, thank you, God, thank you. I, I know I'm safe now. They're not going to come back because you got them out of the room. I didn't scream at them. I didn't say in the name of Jesus, depart from me. I just talked to you, and you got them out, so I'm going to sleep, okay? And, and I, would like to st I would like to stay awake and praise you and, and thank you, but I'm so sick. I'm so dizzy. I feel like I'm going to pass out. So I went to sleep, and when I woke up, there were two of me in bed. One of them was me, and the other one was me. There was one attached to me in the back. I couldn't see him. I kept turning around, but he'd move around, so I couldn't see him. But I could feel him there. It was a very strange, disturbing experience. And we had to go out. Knock, knock, knock. Larry, we got to go out. We gotta, we're on stage in 10 minutes. OK, OK. I'm coming right down. So I went down. That was my brother Charles. I followed him down. I said, I feel really bad. He says, I do too. I don't know if I can get through this. I said, yeah, I don't know. I don't know, but let's try. And we had a band there, a band called Q-Stone from Finland, and they were backing us up. The waiter had been thoughtful enough when we all sat down in the restaurant to say, who are the Americans? And me and my brother went, duh. He said, well, welcome to our country. We have a special meal for you today. Don't order off the menu. We will bring you what we have for you. It's very, very nice, very different. And he made sure that only we got poisoned. Nobody else did. 
So we're on stage, and, and fortunately, although I couldn't remember the lyrics to any of the words, he could. So he was feeding me the lines just a split second before I had to sing them. And I just hoped that when I woke up the next day, he'd be gone. And I couldn't figure out why did they hurt us? What did we do to them? We're not dangerous. We're not political dissidents. Why'd they have to poison us? This is, this is just unbelievable. Well, what happened next was more unbelievable. The doors all opened up, and soldiers came in every door with their rifle raised, with a bayonet on the end, with their rifles pointed at the audience. And somebody came up on stage and said, go, I, I don't know what he said, but apparently it was, get out of here and go home. Because the audience dutifully filed out quickly as possible. And then they told us, you, in English, you have to leave this country. But the Kremlin gave us a, a visa. We have a 10-day visa. I don't care what the papers say. You're getting out. Now, you, you go up to your room, you have five minutes, to take everything, you leave anything behind, we'll throw it away. You're leaving. And it was a two or three hundred mile journey just to get to the nearest border, and they followed us. We didn't see them, but they knew where we were. And we got lost, because the maps in Russia aren't accurate. They've always feared a land invasion, so they've made sure their street maps and their, their country maps are inaccurate. Streets are listed that don't exist. Streets have the wrong name. You'd think they would bother, since we have satellites. We don't really need to go by their map. But, but uh, they were afraid other people would go by the, what was written in their map. So we got lost for 20 minutes. And we finally found our way back to the main road and, and went down. And, uh, about three miles away, somebody stepped out of the bushes with a rifle and made a stop. Where have you been for 20 minutes? What? Where have you been? You should have been here 20 minutes ago. Where you been? Who you was talking to? Who you was visiting? Nobody. We don't even know anybody here. Where were you? What did they give you? N nothing. We, honest, we, we got lost. We, we don't... We don't know anybody, we're not giving anybody, we're not taking anything, you can come in and check. Please come in and check. It's all right, go ahead, go ahead, get out. So how can a massive, powerful governmental structure be afraid of a singer, of a poet, of an author, but they are. And so they confiscate people's manuscripts. They put poets into jail. They try to kill this singer here. I'm, I'm certain that I wouldn't have come out of the hospital. I got back to America and my father said, what happened? You look terrible. I said, Dad, and, and Charlie and I told him, and Dad goes, no, that never happened. Yeah. Who are you? You're nobody. I said, I know. Why would they do that? They didn't. You're nobody. The KGB, they don't even know you're alive. I said, well, it happened, Dad. No, it didn't happen. You, you ate something. It was bad. All right, all right. So I went down to L.A. to go to the doctor. He said, okay, I don't. I'm getting symptoms, but I don't know what it is. What happened? I said, oh, nothing. We were just on tour. We probably picked up a bug. He says, no, it's worse than that. What happened? I said, no, it's, it's nothing. He said, well, tell me. I said, well, we were in Russia, and um, we ate something in our food. I, I think the waiter put something in our food, and we went up to our room. He said, don't tell me anymore. You went up to your room. When you open the door, there are three people waiting inside. They were dressed like nurses. They knew nothing about medicine. They tried to take you to the hospital. And they told you you needed an appendicitis operation. I said, how do you know this? He says, they're felchers. That's common. And then, you know what? 
Then was the first time I was scared. I was so shook up. The things were a lot more real than I thought. The things were gravely serious. But again, I ask you this question, and this is not a prepared speech, but what do you do when you have an insurmountable problem? When you have no money, you just got fired, your dog just ate your cat, the neighbor mowed your dog. What do you do when you have no way of continuing on your path? There's a rock that can't be moved by you. Well, there is no rock so large that God can't lift us over it or take us around it or lift it up and let us go under it. And you have to not leave here tonight thinking, oh, yeah, we heard some music and, and um, s some artist people came to town and, and uh, yeah, he, he loves Jesus a lot. And I want you to leave here going, I love Jesus a lot, saying it of yourself. I love Jesus a lot. And I believe that God is in control of my life. And I believe that nothing will happen to me that God can't solve. And I believe that no temptation will ever overtake me that's not common to man, but that God has provided a way of escape, that I may be able to endure it. The beautiful girl next door with the low-cut blouse, I will be able to endure it. God will change my heart. God will change my eyes. I won't be tempted. I'll minister to her when she has a proper blouse on. I'll invite her whole family to church so that I'm not alone with her, even outside in the yard. We've got to become warriors for Christ. And it's not like when the Jesus movement existed, when people thought all they needed to fight Satan was a piece of paper saying one way, God loves you. No, no, it's a real battle, and we're losing it. There was a time when I was young that I said, oh, there's a prostitute. She needs you, Lord. But what I learned was that, oh, there's a businessman in a very nice suit with a beautiful briefcase. And he needs you? All right, I'll talk to him. I learned that, that God, the whole world is God's market audience, you know, his target. He, he loves everyone. And I, I, I'm, I fear that I'm talking too long. And I just, I pray that God will translate me shorter in your mind and that and uh, and this is the way I've lost my audience uh, I started out with thousands of people in every concert and I lost them little by little by telling them about Jesus they just wanted the music they wanted me to rock out and I don't rock out Jesus rocks out and all I'm concerned about is your spiritual life not your entertainment quotient, but I will n now attempt to, to do something which is the reason, one of the reasons you came for, and it's music. Yeah, here's a little number with numbers. In the midst of the war, he offered us peace. He came like a lover from out of the east With the face of an angel and the heart of a beast His intentions were six, sixty-six He walked up to the temple with gold in his hand And he bought off the priests and propositioned the land The world was his harlot And laid in the sand While the band played 666 <laughs> Bang, 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 bang. It's on the album. Bang, 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 bang,
We served at his table and slept on the floor, but he starved us. He beat us. He nailed us to the door. But I'm ready to die. I can't take any more, and I'm sick of his lies and his tricks. You know he told us he loved us. That was a lie. There was blood in his pockets and death in his eyes. But my number is up, and I'm willing to die if the band will play six, six. If the band will play six, sixty. If the band will play six, sixty. I was going to have Denny play this on guitar, but I'd rather he play on the, the congas and give us a rhythm. And I'd like for you to sing along with this, if you can remember this from your church hymnal. When you know a pretty story, you don't let it go unsaid. You tell it to your children. As you tuck them in the bed When you know a wonderful secret You tell it to your friends Tell them that a lifetime filled with Jesus Is like a street that never ends Oh yeah, yeah You sing that sweet, sweet song of salvation and let your laughter fill the air You sing that sweet, sweet song And tell the, tell the people everywhere You got to sing that sweet To every man in every nation Sing that sweet, sweet song That's right let the people know that Jesus cares. Ba 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 na 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 Your turn. Na 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 Very good. Take a look around you as you sing it. There are people everywhere. And to those who stop to listen, your sweet song becomes their prayer. So if you know a wonderful secret, you got to you tell it to your friends. You tell them that a lifetime farewell You know who is like a street that never ends All right, it's your turn Your turn Your turn And let your laughter fill the air You sing that And tell the people everywhere you got to sing that to every man in every nation. You sing that 
And let the people know that Jesus cares. Okay, one more time, I think, since this is the only time you've been able to speak or breathe this evening. Should we sing the chorus one more time? You sing that sweet, sweet song. Of song. And let your laughter fill the air. Sing that song of salvation tell the people everywhere yeah you got to sing that sweet sweet song to every man in every nation sing that song and let the people know that jesus cares you got to let the people know that jesus cares up and down all around this town walk there let them know let them know let them know that jesus really cares everywhere you go let them know and let the people they need jesus and only jesus he's the one that can free us you let the people know what they do not know and that Heaven is the place where they're welcome to go. Let the people know that Jesus cares. You let the people know that Jesus cares. Faith. 
faithful And so I sit here in this hall How can you use me If I've never given all How can you choose me When you know I'll quickly fall So you touch my soul And help me grow And let me know That you love me I might feel worthless now But help me make a vow And humbly bow before thee Oh, please use me I am lonely I am a servant Getting ready for my part There's been a change A rearrangement There's no returning once I start To live a privilege To love is such an art But I need your help to stop Oh, please purify my heart I am your servant Piece of bread, goodbye, a bag of gold. I wish we'd all been ready. One way, one way to heaven. Oh. Diverged in the middle of my life. I heard a poet sing. I took the road less traveled by, and that's made the difference. Every Walking down this road in my life I don't look left or right Help me face the light 
Help me make it through the night And there's no time to change your mind The sun has come There's no time to change your mind The sun shall come there still is time to change your mind The sun has not yet come And you will be children of the stories with the happy end oh no I don't believe in miracles I know what's real I don't pretend life is no one's friend but then you right in and all my fears fell on the floor do you suppose a miracle is happening to me I don't believe in miracles I've been around I've seen enough only way to get along, baby You must be strong, you must be tough Life is one big bluff But then, all of a sudden I felt so strange I felt a change come, come over me Suppose a miracle is happening. I had a baby out of wedlock. The romance got me in a headlock. Always an unwed father, but don't bother feeling sorry for me. I took a lot of LSD. I smoked a lot of Marjorie, but it did not help me, it did not set me free. Jesus, why'd you go and do it? Why'd you help someone like me? You changed me, you forgave me, and I swear you set me free. Away my problems, you took them all away one by one. I guess God knew what He was doing when He sent His Son. People come from everywhere. Find the love they need to come from love on hate street and the people there are care for one another and try to love everybody that they meet. There's lots of love on hate street.
share their drugs with others that they mean. There was too much drugs on history. When love, 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 that's what everybody really was looking for. Just a lot of love on hate street. We need your strong love and your strange peace. Give us your strong love and your strange, strange peace. Good night. God bless you. with gypsies and don't you have your fortune read even the words you wrote back then are still you truly uh, relevant now floor, and don't you listen to the dead you can't hitchhike your impact your on all of our lives is just amazing I'm just glad that I have an older a brother, you know, a kindred spirit, a brother. Uh, look to that's been an innovator. You know, reincarnate episodes. You can hitchhike to hear. You've uh, probably influenced me more than any other minister. But just being good. The rules were set down long ago when the spikes went in. Go, Larry. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want for anything ever. He leads me beside the still waters that cause me to feel peaceful. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures so I can relax. He restores my soul. He makes me to walk in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. 